Welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 7 of the Mad in America podcast. Thank you so much for getting in touch and sharing your feedback and comments on the podcast so far. If you want to discuss the episodes, you can now visit madinamerica.com forward slash forums. This week we have an interview with Kermit Cole. Kermit is a former filmmaker directing Living Proof HIV and the Pursuit of Happiness in 1994. Kermit has undergraduate and master's degrees in psychology from Harvard, and he has more than a decade of experience working with people in psychotic states. With his partner Louisa Putnam, he works with couples and families with members who have been diagnosed as having a mental illness. Kermit has been part of the team at Madden America since it was founded in January 2012. I was keen to ask Kermit what led to his interest in therapeutic work, his experiences of supporting those in extreme states, and his thoughts on open dialogue approaches. Kermit, thank you so much for talking with me today. I wanted to start by asking about your film Living Proof HIV and the Pursuit of Happiness, which I think was released in 1994. It's a glorious celebration of an issue that was, at the time, surrounded by stigma and prejudice. What led you to make that film, and how did it make you feel to tell those stories? Well, um, one thing that's interesting is um, I can trace sort of the real fork in the road for me to to what I'm doing now with that film. Because up until that point, I'd been um, you know I'd been really looking to be a famous director in the Kubrick slash Spielberg mode, and, uh, and that's what I was shooting for. And uh, I'd been building up a career and a network. And looking, I was basically I was looking for a, a film to make, a feature film to make, and I was, but I was writing scripts. I was, you know, working with actors, you know, doing theater stuff like that. And um, but I stumbled. A friend of mine uh, stumbled on and introduced me to uh, this photo project that had been started. This was in '92, '93. Uh, for it was started by people with HIV and, and AIDS who were on unhappy with the fact that any image that existed of them in public uh, was of, uh, you know, usually of a haggard, moribund, doomed kind of person. Yeah. And uh, and they didn't experience themselves that way and didn't want to be viewed that way. And uh, so they created this photo project uh, to create, you know, really full, vibrant images and say, this is who I am. And I get to choose to define myself mm. and to define my, my life and to define my death. And I got really interested, you know, immediately hooked. I just, one thing I realized is I can do this. I can make this happen. I had the network and just started, just started doing it because it had to happen right then. So I found myself running around New York, you know, in the, being in the living room, so people with, with HIV and AIDS. And the basic question I was asking was, how is your life better uh, than it might might have been hmm. if you hadn't found out you were HIV positive? And the answer is you, you can pretty much predict. I'd say I, I, I pay attention to what's important, and I don't sweat the small stuff. You know, really spend time with my the people I care about, and I don't suffer fools, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But you know, the real thing was what you could feel, which was a real, real zest for life. And my feeling at the time was, you know, I wanted to make this film, and I wanted to. I, I thought inevitably at some point in the future, everybody will realize that they have to come to a new understanding of this because at the time it just seemed like anybody even the progressive liberal people i knew more or less you know nobody understood what was going on really at the time or what was going to happen and they there was a sense of you know if i just kind of turn my eyes for a couple of years maybe it'll they'll all die and it'll, they'll all go away but the thing that really hit me was when i was i would say to pe- people um i'd be trying to find the hook I'd go to dinner parties and say, I'm interested in doing this. And people would say, well, why, why would you do it? You know, and, and aren't these people all, because at the thing, you know, they said things, you know, they said, well, you're, you're not gay. You're not in that world. You're not. And I said, well, that's why I should do it. Cause you know, this is about building bridges. Uh, I thought I'm, I'm the perfect person to, you know, sort of be a guide into this world. But the thing that really got me was, you know, when I'd say, and some of these people have had HIV for 10 years and they're going strong. And then people would sort of shift, you know, they'd shift and they'd say, and then it would start to seem like it would be an important thing to do. And what I took from that was, I felt like they were saying, well, geez, if they're going to be alive for 10 years, I might have to deal with this. Two years, maybe I can just ignore them for 10 years. And somehow, and I, and I, I guess basically what I thought was a person's life should not be appraised on the basis of its duration. 
You know, it's a very economic assessment of mm. how to value a person. And we should be able to engage with a person right up and through the, to the moment, you know, right up through death and beyond and, and keep them in our souls. And I wanted to make a film that would do that. Mm. And so some of the things I played with in the film, was in the editing, there's people who, there's, you know, one person, one person, one person did in fact die during the shooting. Mm. Uh, and we were invited by his family to come film the service. So we shot it. It's in the film, but I edited it in such a way that you're not 100% sure that his memorial service is what you're seeing. I mean, it could be an award ceremony. You, you know, and most people know, but a few people were puzzled, and that was that was deliberate because mm. I wanted when he appears late again later in the film, I wanted people to have to search in their hearts for how they feel about him and how they would feel if he had died, or you know how they feel about him seeming to be alive and. Anyway, so having gone through all that, basically I realized after it that where I wanted to go and the way in which I wanted to be with people really wasn't uh, ideally facilitated by having a camera. And in some ways, having a camera really got in the way because ultimately, I mean, I didn't know this at the time, but I kind of felt it. Mm -hmm. I, wanted, I knew I wanted to go to really, I wanted to go to the, some of the really frightening and, 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 and hard places that people go because I really needed to understand them. That was just something I needed to do. Uh, and I felt kind of driven toward it. I didn't have words for it. And in fact, I ended up going back to school after that film. I just really, like, I lost my taste for the mainstream media. I mean, I was basically becoming more and more interested in things that seemed to interest fewer and fewer people, which is, you know, not a good uh, algorithm for a career in a mass medium. So you know, I just thought, okay, i got to leave the camera behind. I, I got to... And then ultimately, when I was in school and started working in research with people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia and other things, uh, I just realized this is, this is where I'm going. But the real thing I was interested in, but I didn't, hadn't known it yet, was I was interested in trauma. Because that was something that, of course, like anybody, you know, ripples through, rippled through my life. But for myself, in some ways, that were a little more extreme than some. So, you know, I've been around people throughout my life who were you know, seriously traumatized and dissociative and suicidal. But I didn't know that that meant anything. I just thought, okay, well, that's just something that happened. But I'm, I'm free of it now, and I'm going on to a career of glory in the film business. But after that film, I lost my taste for that. It just wasn't interesting. And ultimately, I, I needed to just drop the camera because I wanted to and ultimately did go to places with people who were traumatized in ways that I, I really I question a camera could ever do justice to. Thank you. You also write beautifully about supporting people in psychotic states and also people who may feel the urge to harm themselves. And I just wondered what it was in your experience that means that you're comfortable in situations that many people would find quite distressing and challenging. Well, it's a lot of things. I mean, as for one thing, I, I grew up sort of on the border of that. I mean, I, the people that I was close to growing up kind of introduced me to that state. So I know that being in that state is... Not a, there's no direct correlation to how long you're actually going to be alive. So I, I also know that some of the times, I, I mean, I have put myself in these situations. I, I've had friends that were significantly one of the people who's in the film uh, became a friend of mine and would often say, well, I don't know why I don't kill myself. And he didn't know what his future was like. And he was also, he was happened to be from, he, happened, he was struggling with his sexual identity, and he was from a, happened to be from a Catholic family that disapproved, and he was a very brilliant person who was having a hard time finding his place in the world, you know, fulfilling that. And I would often sit with him while he was working through this issue. And, uh, and at one point, out of desperation, I just said, he, you know, he said, I don't know why I don't kill myself. And I said, I don't know, why don't you? And that kind of turned the, you know, the, turned the equation around and he started arguing for reasons that he shouldn't so I just in that moment realized oh that's that's a good one good way to go and ultimately he did kill himself and um, when I, after I'd left New York because I got you know I needed to get out of that line of work so I left and I didn't talk to him for a little while and when I reached out back to him he was gone at the time I thought I, I'm gonna need to get better at this it just seems to be a part of my life so it's something I'm gonna have to get good at so I worked at it. You know, I went to, I went, you know, I, I got to work on a suicide hotline, which was a way to kind of uh, isolate certain aspects of doing this work. Uh, while I was doing that, I, I, I focused a lot on trying to 
I actually would think in terms of trying to push my self, my sense of humanness through the phone, things like that. I just really tried to connect. And so that was a pretty good exercise. And that taught me a lot. And uh, it was on, on that, there was another guy who I remember saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it tonight. I'd talked to him several times. And then, well, you know, this one night he was saying, I'm going to do it tonight. This is it. Unless you tell me something. Unless you give, give me what I need to know. Mm. And, I, and out of desperation, nothing else, not wisdom, I, I just said, I said, well, I, I don't have anything to tell you. you know, I said, you're a smart guy. And anything I try to say to answer that question, you know, was a, was a lie. I got nothing. And then he said, well, now I know I can trust you. Now we can, well, we can work together. And so we, you know, kept talking and he called back other nights and we came up with ideas for things that he could pursue uh, productively. I mean, I mean, I think suicidality is actually intrinsic to being human in the sense of that question. Uh, you know, it's like, really, am I helping? Am I worth it? Am I, am I of value? Mm. Would it be better for everybody if I just took this pain I feel and took it out of you know, the, the lives of the people I care about. I mean, I think there's, at some risk, I'll say, I think there's an aspect of altruism to the impulse. Uh, so when I went to work in the group home, and, you know, there's a lot of people there talked about suicide. Often, I think it's just talking about the hope of being out of pain. But there were some people where, when they talked about suicide, it was it had a very concrete, very cold, clear, simple reality to it. I mean, this was something something that just sort of made sense and that they were planning and that they were going to do. In those cases, where I, again, out of desperation, uh, because you know, I certainly would have lost my job if the conversation had gone beyond the two of us, uh, what I said was, that makes perfect sense to me, that that's, where you, that that's what you're thinking about. You have every right to be out of pain. And if this is the only way you know to be out of pain, then I have no right to question your right to, be, to do it. And they would be sort of startled. They said, nobody ever said that before. I'd say, all right, well, so as long as you know that I will never question that you have the absolute existential right to choose whether to be in pain or not, while we're working together and knowing that I will never question that, let's just spend our time looking at whether there might be any other less irre irreversible options. And in those cases that I'm thinking of, that was the beginning of a, of a positive direction. You know, because I think, I mean, I think people who are in that state, you know, the state that they're in is I have no options. I, there's no way out of this trap. Uh, all the rights, you know, all the, I, I've had every decision taken away from me. And uh, so I have no value. And if I'm not making decisions, then what, what, what am I contributing? It feels like a solution for some, doesn't it? When presented with difficulty, we want to find a solution. And if there is no solution, it's understandable that people will consider suicide. But how awful to try and medicate that away rather than what you've done, which is to try and connect with someone and understand what's brought them to that point. Yeah, and it, it, it's even sort of, in a, in a way I'll say, beyond understanding. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just a simple... I. Yeah, I'm here with you. Uh, I'm not going away. And, uh, you know, we're in it. Uh, same as if we were on our life raft. We're, we're just in this. And we need to figure out how to get out of it. Uh, or, where, or where we want to go. And, I mean, I, like I said, with these, you know, the people that, where I felt like that was the place that we're at. Where, and and I'm, I'm talking about people who had a very concrete plan. I mean, this was, you know, this was going to happen. Mm. Um and, uh, you know, not impulsive, just something that, you know, if they, once they did the calculus of their life to that moment, this was the next, the next step. And um, so it was, you know, it, was just, it wasn't just the understanding. It was also the saying, okay, and I am in it. And I actually did say to, to more than one person, and if that is what you end up choosing to do, I will, I will not judge you. And... I was kind of implying I would be there with them, mm. and I would have been if that's what had happened. Mm. And it wasn't what happened. And I took a little bit of inspiration for this from uh, a, a suicide center in uh, Toronto that was staffed by uh, all survivors of suicide attempts. And they had a their bedrock rule was we will not prevent anybody. And if they come here and say that they're going to and then attempt suicide here, we will not stop them. And it was a, a seemingly very paradoxical approach to have for the suicide prevention center. But uh, what they said when I when I talked to the woman who started it, what she said was, 
all I can tell well, she said two things. She said, one, you know, our, our philosophy is that if somebody knows that, that they are not alone, you know, to this depth that somebody would stay with them and not prevent it, then it's the not being alone that prevents it. She said, and we are the only suicide center in Toronto that have not had a completed suicide. So call it paradoxical, but, you know, the outcomes are uh, hard to ignore. They are, and we have to treat people like adults. I think there's an assumption that it's always a sudden urge or impulse, and it might be, but many people have spent a long time thinking and considering ending their life as a way out of their difficulties, and that needs appreciation and understanding, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, <laughs> it just starts with saying, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's a, mm. uh, one person I worked with uh, closely, um, you know, when I asked her what, what has helped you, uh, she referred to prior psychiatrist, I think, who's, who just sort of, again, took it all into account and said, okay, just don't harm the body. Let's see if there's something else that we can work on. And somehow she took that. She, that when she was very suicidal and self-harming, somehow she would take that. And she would just, at those moments, she'd say, okay, just don't harm the body. Because it's, you know, it's not like when I started out on this stuff, somebody cutting themselves didn't horrify me. It did. Mm. Uh, uh, I didn't know how to relate to it, but then when it when I started thinking of it this way, it was like, oh, this just makes sense, and then I could connect to it, and it would feel, you know, like, and and then from there, actually, I guess it was after that that I started building to an idea of understanding the impulse to suicide. Thank you, Kermit. And I wanted to ask specifically about a situation you describe where someone you were supporting held a strong belief that aliens had given them the cure for cancer. It was just so refreshing to hear someone be honest enough not to collude with a person who had a delusion, but was willing to occupy that space without judgment. I'm from a world where I have been medicalized, and every statement that I've made has been analyzed and judged against a set of criteria, but it was powerful to read an account of interacting with someone without taking the power away from their belief by being judgmental. Well, the story was, you know, the, the, somebody was saying to me and very insistently, that and seeming to try to convince me that aliens had given him the cure for cancer, mm. and uh, he really at first it was very insistent in a way that was a little you know I, well I just didn't know what to do with it. I could neither affirm or, or deny. <laughs> I just and what I said was uh, well that's not my area. I, you know I'm not I'm not an authority on that. And what I was essentially saying in that, which I mean the way I would put it now having situation being very early in my career and now having other people having given me the words for it is that I was trying not to have epistemic authority, that I was trying to remain epistemically neutral. That I, I, I just simply didn't have the authority to say whether this had happened or not. And I, but I, I certainly knew that saying whether it happened or not wasn't going to help us. Mm. It wasn't going to help us at all. No, but I could feel that there was something driving this. So I just said that. I, I, you know, I, that's not my area. I can't. I can't really answer that question of whether it happened or not. And then he turned, and, and then it, I'd say he's, he shifted slightly, and it became a little more plaintive. And he started to say, well, what, um, what do you think? Could it have happened? And I said, well, I don't know. Um, actually, what I said was, uh, at the time, was I said, well, what is it? You know, the cure for cancer would be a really good thing to have. <laughs> and, he, and he said, well, that's the thing. I, they won't let me remember it until I believe. So what do you think? Is this, do you think this could have happened? And this was a very soft, gentle request uh, for affirmation. Mm. And I asked him, again, that's not my area. I don't know whether it could have happened, but what my area is and what I'm interested in is, what would it mean to you if you had the cure for cancer? And he said, he just blurted out, said, well, then people would really like me. And uh, you know, I almost cried because I could... That feeling, I know. And that's what I said. I said, I said well, that I get. <laughs> uh, that, that I can connect with. Mm. And he knew it. I didn't even say anything. We just connected. And, but what I also realized at the time was that my desire from the past of wanting to be a famous film director was no less crazy. You know, I mean, I, I started out with this deep insecurity. This, 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 I, I didn't believe that anybody could ever love me. Uh, or even like me um, for who I was. Mm. So I had to become somebody I wasn't, and it had to be strangers that would that would like or love me. Because you know, so I, I'd get them to love a film I made, 
and the people in it. But I thought it was going to be enough for me to just sort of stand up there in front of the movie screen and and have these feelings wash over me from strangers, and that would fill the hole that I felt. Mm. And I realized it doesn't, and that's in fact crazy. The desire to be loved by a stranger is in, intrinsically, you know, paradoxical and self defeating. And uh, and that's uh, looking back, one of the reasons that I, you know, kind of got off that track. But it, what it, what that gave me was in that moment with that man, I realized. You know, my delusion in searching for this was no less crazy than wanting to believe that aliens could have given him the cure for cancer. I was just lucky that I chose a way to fulfill that need that happened to be functional and adaptive in the world. It, it, you know, people could look at it and say, wow, look, look at you. That's, that's great. Whereas, you know, China convinced people he had the cure if the aliens gave me, gave me the cure for cancer, you know, doesn't. Isn't, you know, isn't very, uh, you know, it's not very socially advantageous. And that's the pure difference. And then after, after that experience, I mean, I ended up after, you know, when I was leaving the film business, I, I ended up in some hard places. I was really, really depressed. And because uh, I had worked my entire adult life to have a skill that I had, and then I just walked away from a home in that, in that world that I gave up. And there came a point where I was like, well, I, I'm, I'm either going to end up in a hospital or I have to go to school. I was very blessed to have the choice, but most people don't. So a lot of what I do really is motivated by a feeling of indebtedness to the fact that I had a choice that others didn't, and some of those being people who are close to me who are no longer alive. Thank you, Kermit. And I wanted to ask about your therapeutic approach. And I understand that you work with your partner, Louisa. I just wanted to ask how you approach working together as a partnership, because that's not as common as one-on-one therapy. So Louisa and I... Uh, met uh, because in a lot of ways we were on very parallel paths. We were very uh, interested in um, you know, compelled really uh, to work with people identified as having psychosis uh, both because of our professional paths and because of our things that had been or were happening in our families. And um, we both you know, before we met, had both acquired houses uh, with the intention of creating respites for people to avoid the hospital or avoid uh, treatments that they didn't didn't want to do, you know, that, that they were otherwise being compelled to do. Mm. And um, I had wanted to create a sort of soteria-like house. Uh, for a lot of years, I'd wanted to you know, I'd been trying to get a project like that going, and then I, I just decided to just go ahead and do it really on my own, kind of off the grid, really off the map, just because I, I was worn out on trying to make it happen through official channels. I mean, I'd, I'd sort of done it in places I'd worked, and with good success, I'll say, but uh, it's a very uh, difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, I, was, I was, I guess, in some ways, I was drawn to take risks, I guess, and partly out of sense of justice. You know, I felt like I'd had a really good life. And, um, you know, when I was confronted with people who I felt were having their lives really robbed uh, or didn't, or just didn't have a chance from the beginning. You know, I just, I was drawn further and further into working with people who had either been given up on or, you know, had been told not to have hope. And um, I was just drawn to that. And Louise is really the same way. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the harder somebody is, then the, the less willing she is to give up. And uh, so was, people had tried to connect us actually a couple of times. Uh, and then ultimately she was part of creating a conference uh, at Esalen in California, which was originally founded by somebody who was trying to deal with extreme states and find alternative and non-mainstream ways of understanding and experiencing and, and, and managing extreme states. And that grew, grew into one of the big, you know, spa health you know, centers in the United States uh, or the world. And a lot of philosophy decades ago came out of there for the, you know, human potential movement. Uh, you know, a lot of people moved through there. Um, and so there was a group of people who were trying to sort of revive that legacy at Esalen, of working with extreme states, not just the the worried well. And um, 
Louisa was part of that and basically, yeah, joined up and started more or less our journey around the world looking for the best ways to work with people. Mm. Uh, I mean, not all the way around the world, but, you know, a lot of hops over to Europe, to Sweden, to Karina Hawkinson's uh, care homes, and, um, and we also went to Tornio. And it's worth noting there that the reason I got... You know, as I'd done a lot of work in residential, and even when we did really good, you know, had good outcomes in terms of people, you know, really reassessing their own issues and, and getting out of treatment and getting off meds and um, redefining themselves as not an ill person. Uh, what I had found over time is that the minute they went back to their family environment, all that would just fall apart. And so I kind of learned over time that the family really had to be included in the process if only so that people could transition out of the residential successfully. And then that eventually grew in part because I'd learned about open dialogue, but just naturally to really trying to incorporate working with, fam working with families in the process. And of course, in the process of doing that learning, wow, when you really unravel the assumptions and expectations and misunderstandings, uh, between people and, and, and create safe spaces for them to learn to you know, really feel each other uh, and, and be and, and even safe to love each other you know without stepping on each other's feet all the time you know really good things happen and all the you know, very often I'd see parents say well you know I was dealing with very similar things as you are now when I was your age which oftentimes you know, the person, the struggling person really didn't know. Mm. Uh, so when they, when that really became clear, like, I mean, I'm just visualizing one situation where a very successful father who was, you know, pretty, you know in terms of business and socially successful man who, who opened up and acknowledged, you know, the, the great fear that he felt when he was young and the risks that he had to take. It really, you know, the, the young man really re, reassessed uh, things and, and you know ended up applying to school and really getting out of what had previously been an expectation of years or, or a lifetime of, of just treatment and hospitalization and um, so that's just one you know one really clear example I had of you know getting to work with the families and of course open dialogue for us was the clearest example of that because it's the example that we have of a systemic and family slash more importantly systemic uh, oriented systemically oriented focus really becoming or being made to be the whole standard of a system I mean, the default response to all mental health crises in in Torneo is to is to respond to the network that's in crisis not an individual but you know a network and in which a person's behavior has sort of raised the flag that something needs to be addressed. And, uh, you know, the outcome in Torneo is that responding that way, you know, led to the strongest outcomes for psychosis uh, in the Western world today. And also, uh, at least in the 90s, uh, a 30% reduction in their uh, municipal expenditures on mental health crises. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't have data after the 90s, but from the data that we have was a tremendous reduction in, in expense. So that's the example we have from Tornio. So following that example, we did the trainings that we could, but that basically led us to realizing that getting trained and working as family therapists was going to be a really good way to go because you know, unless and until there's the opportunity to actually work in a fully open dialogue way, meaning, you know, using that dialogical slash systemic orientation in a system that has made it, made it the entire standard of care all the way into a hospital and throughout the system. Until that exists, until that opportunity exists, and the best, we, we thought one of the best opportunities we'd have is to say we're going to work with families. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when possible families that have had a member that's been identi identified with a diagnosis. And we can do that quietly. We can do it legitimately. Uh, we don't have to be 
renegades uh, per se. We don't have to change the whole system. We can just say this is what we choose to work with, and and very often we find that we can, in fact, gently ease people out of what they had thought was going to be a diagnosis and a treat and a treatment standard that they had no escape from. And oftentimes, you know, if we, you know armed with a family therapy license, we can do that. You know, as I said, pretty pretty quietly. Yeah. But and the other thing was the reason we went and trained that way was because you know we did want to work in the open dialogue model, uh, where it, it is a team. It's at least two therapists working all together, uh, working together all the time. Kermit, when you work with Louisa, do you work in a similar way, or are you different stylistically? Well, we are very very different people, and we are very different styles, and. Uh, so sometimes it means, you know, in the moment we, we, we compare notes and we say, well, we could do this or we could try that. Uh, but I think often what happens is, you know, people are different. And so it, it usually is becomes kind of clear that one of our perspectives is the one that kind of is a better match for the moment. Um, and I often find myself sitting back and just sort of watching with wonder at Louisa kind of you know, channeling the spirit of the great, the great, some of the great therapists, and just the, the ways that she can find a way in with a person and kind of find what they need and give it to them is, can be, you know, something I'd call semi miraculous. Um, whereas sometimes other people, you know, need the kind of at least uh, overtly, you know, empirical and rational way that I often seem, you know, seem to speak. <laughs> Those small moments of connection, however made, are crucial, but so difficult to find and require so much knowledge, compassion and understanding to be able to get to a place where you can think what would motivate this person, what would interest them, what would excite them. That's very different to a lot of the medical attention that I've received, which was about enforcing views on me rather than seeking my experiences. I think one way to think of it, or what I was thinking of it, is that um, it's also about if you can find a way to for people to safely do the things that they would really truly be naturally inclined to do in the best of circumstances anyway. Uh, I mean, I think we want to connect with other people and we want to do right by them and we want to help each other. And usually there's something getting in the way of that. There's fear. We've been taught, we've learned uh, to, to stifle that impulse or not, not follow it. And, you know, for, for good reasons, I'm not, you know, I mean, people get hurt. So it's all about collectively trying to say, okay, well, how do we make it safe again to do the things that really being human is all about? I, mean, I think that I believe everybody really carries within them the impulse to do right by others, even even to the point of self-sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, it's just that they can't, they have a hard time believing in a given moment that this is a moment that they can trust that instinct and that, they, that, that it will result in the good thing and, and, and that it will you know, they won't get unduly hurt. But in that circumstance, people will be enormously self-sacrificing. Well, in the UK, fairly recently, we've had a prime example of that with a concert bombing in Manchester where people rushed towards the scene, caring little for their own safety, but reaching out to help and support the injured, providing food and water, even helping police officers who are traumatised themselves. It's just a shame that it takes something so awful to bring out that spirit, but it does give you faith in humanity. Well, I think it points, yeah, it points to something that is just fundamental to who we are. I mean, I don't think anybody would question if you were if you were clinging to a, a life raft with you know you and a five year old child, uh, you know, in that in, in icy water, uh, and there was room for one of you. I mean, who 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 gets to be on the life raft? <laughs> you, I feel pretty confident, would put the five-year-old on there. Mm. And I think anybody else would, you know, it's a rare person who wouldn't. And none of the people who, are, who did that would be called crazy. None of them. You know, they, would, they, would, they, they, would, they wouldn't be called suicidal. They'd be called heroes. Mm. I mean, that, that is who we are. That is the fact of us. Thank you, Kermit. As we come towards the close, I just wanted to ask about how you came to be involved with Mad in America. Uh, I met Bob when his first book, When Mad in America, the book came out. I read it uh, overnight. I couldn't put it down. You know, it read like like a detective story where the mystery was, could we possibly be this stupid? And, um, you know, I won't give away the the ending. (laughs) 
And uh, and the next morning, I saw that he lived in the same city I did, Cambridge. So I called him up. And uh, some years later, when he decided to start the website, he, he called me up and said, you want to do this? That's what I well, that's what I've been doing, because I, I think he is one of the heroes of our time. I mean, I know that he got into it for the purest of reasons and got moved along by a, the same feeling of indebtedness to people who had suffered, you know, and, and I'm, I'm in a unique position in the world to tell people what it's like to work closely with them over a period of now five and a half years. And I can say it, it just gets better. I mean, I, he, you know, every, every time there's been a choice between self-interest and the greater good, I can tell you with absolute certainty, he always chose the latter. And uh, but going back to the, the project itself, it's just been, you know, just being part of trying to create a social network of people that have this common understanding and this, you know, the validation that his work has provided to their experiences, which prior to that were being systematically, I mean, literally systematically by the system, discredited, the sort of Kafka-esque experience that people had over the 30-year rise of the biomedical model which for many people ended with reading his, his book and, and others. For a lot of people, I know a lot of people where this book was the one that said, you are not, in fact, crazy, that these medications are, in fact, having the effect on you that you feel that they are having, and they are not, and, and you are correct when you say that they are not helping you. And Kermit, why do you think that is? Because I think that you know, a lot of these medications have become you know, sort of uh, our societal act of communion for people who feel disenfranchised or bad or wrong, you know, they have an authority figure saying, here, you know, put this on your tongue and all will be forgiven. And then we see that happening in hospitals. And I've seen it happening that somebody who's, you know, really out there and apparently dangerous within days of agreeing to take medication is set free without any medical tests to affirm that they are the right drug or, or even having any effect. It's really the act of agreement that sets them free, that sets them on a course of some years of, well, we all know what happens. I mean, you go from drug to drug to drug until eventually you say, I think maybe something different is called for. And But the problem by then is that your body and your mind, your brain have been changed. Mm-hmm. And the, the question that we have in front of us as a society now is, uh, is that change then permanent? And can we in any way justify having done that to people, given all those harms and the deaths that we know have accrued is the individual or collective sense of safety or certainty that, that we've gained from that just something that can possibly justify the fact that a lot of people have been have experienced harms or deaths on the basis of something that when you really get into the research or you really push uh, most psychiatrists on the subject will agree that it was a lie. So even if even if people benefit from you know the, the placebo effect or whatever we call it. Even if that's true, and I do believe in placebo effects, I have used them, and I do use them. It's, a, it's that nexus of placebo effect and lies that we're kind of trying to sort out the balance of. I think in the end, you have to say, well, you have to, you have to choose not lying, even though there are people who might have benefited from, might have felt better for a short period from being told that, the, that a toxic substance would help them. And that's that's a hard choice, you know, telling somebody the hard truth. But it's the same. I put that in the same column as t- saying to somebody who is talking about killing themselves, saying to them, that is your right. You know, if I were to say that it was not your right or that you owed it to anybody not to or whatever, you know, I would be, I, I'd just be wrong. <laughs> I mean, it would be foolish because, of course, you could just walk out here and, 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 and do it. It's foolish for me to pretend that I have any control over that. So I'd rather, it's just better for me to just say, well, this is just true. And where do we go from there? Life, being human, hurts. And the only way we can hope for that to not be ultimately traumatizing and something that turns life itself into a long, tragic travail is uh, by somehow learning how to be with each other in a way that ameliorizes and even makes the possibility of something that nature hadn't even planned for. I mean, I think that's the great thing about being human is, you know, we've, we expect from people and we reasonably expect a level of experience, a level of the experience of our lives of dancing and singing and loving that, you know, might never have existed before humans and might never again. 
And so it's, that's a miracle that I think it's, it's a tragic waste of to call people crazy who fall short of it. Thank you so much, Kermit. It was such an interesting discussion. And thank you for sharing your experiences with me for the podcast. Madden America News and Updates. On Madden America this week, Shannon Peters writes about a new study published in the International Journal of Mental Health Promotion that examines the benefit of art courses on mental well-being and social inclusion. The results of the service evaluation study conducted in Open Arts Essex programs in the UK suggest introductory art courses can benefit individuals with mental health difficulties. The researchers, led by Carrie Wilson from Anglia Ruskin University in the UK, write... The results of this six-month follow-up study of participatory arts courses add further weight to the growing evidence that arts participation is an effective means of promoting mental well-being and social inclusion for people experiencing or at risk of mental health problems. Initial evaluations of the art courses at Open Arts Essex suggest the experience improves well-being and social inclusion, two domains that are prioritised in England's mental health policy. Given the demonstrated short-term benefits of Open Arts Essex, the researchers sought to provide the first long-term evaluation of the art courses. Ten arts courses in visual arts, drama and percussion were evaluated. Course participants were invited to answer questionnaires at the beginning and end of the course, as well as follow-up assessments three and six months after the course had ended. The researchers collected data from 106 participants, although fewer participants completed the end of the course and follow-up questionnaires. The majority of participants were white, female and middle-aged. The researchers state all respondents reported enjoying their course and over 90% reported increased motivation to do artwork and other activities. Over 80% also reported improved confidence, feeling more positive about things and improved relationships as a result of participation. For both well-being and social inclusion, participants had significantly higher scores at the end of the art courses compared to the beginning. These gains remained high at the three-month follow-up. Improvements in well-being and social inclusion were reduced at the six-month follow-up, but scores at six months were still significantly greater than initial scores. The majority of the participants who responded to the three- and six-month follow-ups continued making art. Some participants also reported taking up additional activities such as volunteering as a result of participating in the art classes. The researchers suggest this is evidence supporting the positive benefits of art for mental well-being and social inclusion. The authors note the limitation that they were unable to include a control group and therefore cannot be sure the improvements are not due to other factors. In addition, the study may be subject to response bias. A smaller number of participants who responded to the follow-ups may differ from participants who chose not to respond. Peter Simons writes about a new study published in the journal Annals of Family Medicine. Researchers interviewed doctors about the barriers that prevent them from being able to decrease excess medications. Doctors called it swimming against the tide, citing patient expectations, the medical prescribing culture, and the structure of the medical business as factors making it difficult to deprescribe. This is particularly striking in light of the recent study that found that people who want to decrease their psychiatric medication found their mental health providers unhelpful. Adverse drug events and resultant hospital admissions are common in older people, costing health systems billions of dollars every year, the researchers write. Up to 10% of hospital admissions result from drug-related problems, two-thirds of which are considered preventable through safer prescribing. Particularly for older people, the taking of multiple prescribed medications may lead to dangerous drug interactions and side effects. The researchers write that careful prescription practices, including deprescribing, can help reduce these risks. However, the authors write that despite evidence to guide safe prescribing, high-risk prescribing in older people is common, with one in five prescriptions potentially inappropriate. The researchers were led by Catherine Wallace at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. They hoped to get an insider's look into what barriers prevent doctors from feeling confident in deprescribing. As such, they interviewed 24 physicians from a variety of practice settings and years of experience. According to the doctor's interview, deprescribing was not rewarded by the medical profession. The only incentive to deprescribing they identified was the duty to do what was right for the patient. That is, these doctors effectively considered the safety and benefit of the patient to be at odds with the culture of prescribing enforced in the medical profession. According to the researchers, doctors said prescribing was the easy option, while deprescribing was time-consuming and came with inherent risks both for themselves and the patients. They said patients expected there to be a pill for every ill, and that this expectation was exacerbated by direct-to-consumer advertising of medicines in New Zealand. 
The United States is the only other country that allows direct-to-consumer advertising of medications. The authors also write that some physicians, especially the younger and less experienced ones, described a professional etiquette that left them reluctant to stop medicines initiated by others. They felt uncomfortable going against the prescribing of the patient's usual doctor and of specialists, both of whom they felt knew better than they did. The doctors also mentioned ideas to make deprescription more accessible, including improvements to clinical practice guidelines, scheduled sessions to review medications with patients, better collaboration with patients, and improved training on how to deprescribe. According to the researchers, the only current reason doctors consider deprescription is their individual judgment of what's best for their patients. The researchers therefore encourage policy and research improvements that will help support the primary goals of physicians, to help rather than harm their patients. For more on these, plus news items, blogs, personal stories, and more, visit maddenamerica.com. So thank you so much for listening today, and also remember that you can give us comments and feedback using the email address podcasts at maddenamerica.com. And if you're listening in iTunes, please consider leaving us a review, because reviews really help to get more listeners engaged with the issues that we're discussing. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.